Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Fantastic. Um, sorry for being late. I just had some things I wanted to finish up. Oh, with. no, no, no worries at all. <laughs> Fantastic. I, I, I think it might also be another short chapter because I haven't finished finishing this. I haven't finished reading this chapter itself. Um, I think we started off with like the basics of modeling itself, uh, just like an introduction for everything that we want to accomplish. And I think the next bit of this chapter is now going into like the, the detail in the chapter itself. And mm -hmm. it starts with visualizing models. So under these visualizing models, there are, there are two big parts. It talks about predictions and residuals, uh, uh, a bit more clearly. Um, and under the prediction part, um, I think it also further breaks down into different types of variables. So if you are comparing, let's say, two continuous variables or one continuous, one categorical variable, you know, the things that you should do. So I haven't finished the chapter itself. Um, I think the entire lecture is probably going to take maximum 30 minutes. Um, and you probably out of here and, and mm -hmm. try to finish it. Yeah, later. sure. Suit yourself. <laughs> no problem. By Fantastic. Okay. Fantastic. Let me see if I have too much yet. All right. So I could probably kick off. Um, well, let's see. Let's see where we end up. Great. All right. So, so like I like I said, uh, I think the entire idea of the chapter, uh, like the way I started this last week, was um, reading through this chapter. Kind of took me back to the picture representation that we have when you are walking through a data set itself. So, starting from importing your data, tidying up your data transforming your data, visualizing it, modeling it, and now finally communicating. Um, and I think, I think that picture is well represented in the idea of this chapter itself, uh, because one of the things that I think the book tries to teach is um, most of these processes, like all of the processes I just mentioned, um, they are all, it's not one step after the other. Sometimes you might actually have to visualize first before you do a model. Um, sometimes you might need to tidy before you visualize, before you do a model. So it depends. And what the book is trying to sell is for you to have toolkits in all of these things that you're going to be doing. Now, regarding modeling specifically, uh, what the book is also trying to sell is two things. One, there are different ways to get to the answer itself, and especially if we define the answer as your predictive value, right? There are different ways to end up there. Um, but the methodology that you end up there, there are certain principles that you do need to follow through. So number one is if you have a data set, can you reduce that, that data set into a simplified equation? And like I said in the last class, a simplified equation will probably be best represented using algebraic terms. So Y, X, Z, and things like that. So that, that's the first principle. Second principle is understanding that whatever data set you have is just an assumed case of what is going on in the real, in real world, right? So whatever analysis you come up with, whatever prediction you come up with um, is, is still going to be an assumed case. So you shouldn't really kill yourself if you don't have a best fit model, right? So far you have something that is close, is close, is closely representing what real life situation looks like, then you're good to go. The second part of this chapter, after the introduction bit, now tries to explain that, how do you get to a close fit model, right? And it starts off with visualizing models, right? Um, so I'll probably just read through the parts that I, that I highlighted here. So he said, for simple models, like the one in the previous section, like the ones we have been working before, so let's say a model like Y is equals to MX plus C, you can figure out what pattern the model captures by carefully studying the model family and the fitted coefficients. So in, 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 a model, in a model that has been simplified into an equation called y is equal to mx plus c, the model family there is going to be a linear model. The fitted coefficient is going to be the x, you know, which takes up the gradient, the m, and the c, which takes up the intercept. So if you're looking at the simplified model that way, it's kind of easy if you want to study the pattern of that model, you can clearly study a linear model, also clearly study like how fitted those coefficients, the X and the C is, right? 
But one of the things the book represents is we are actually going to try to understand a model here by looking at the predictions. So in that y is equals to mx plus c, we are going to try to study a model by looking at the y itself, right? So the, the, the actual output of the model. And it says this has, this has a big advantage. In fact, two big advantages. Number one is predictive models make predictions. I mean, <laughs> by virtue of the name itself. Then the second bit is in terms of residuals, right? So it's also useful to see what the model does not capture, right? So let me take a step back here. So when I first described that, you know, if you can get your data sets to, to closely represent what the actual real life scenario looks like, that's fine enough. In, in that statement itself, there's, there's a room, there's room that is created for what is called error, right? So error is something that your model can't capture. And in this book, that's defined as residuals, right? So it says residuals are powerful because they allow us to use models to remove striking patterns so we can study the subtle trends that actually remain, right? So let's, let's start with this. Let's start with understanding predictions a lot better. Then we'll now go into residuals next, right? So if I start with predictions. So to visualize predictions for a model, we start by generating an evenly spaced grid of values that cover the region where data lies. So for the next, uh, let's say five, 10 minutes of this book, what it just tries to do is just go to like first principles. Let's assume we are creating a data set from scratch, right? And it just tries to walk through what are the R functions you use to create that data set from scratch. And you keep adding on that data set itself. And, and I, I think this is quite useful in terms of understanding what the chapter is trying to preach a lot more granularly. So he said, the easiest way to generate this evenly spaced grid of values is by using model R data grid, right? The first argument here is a data frame, right? And for each subsequent argument, it finds a unique variable and then generates all combinations. So let's walk through the function. So I create an object called grid. I run it through a data set that is called sin one. I pipe this using through the data grid function and I name a colon called X. Now the output is a table, right? That creates 10 rows and one colon called X, right? So this will get more interesting as we start to add more variables to this model itself. Now, if I want to add more variables, he said, next, let's try to add a prediction, right? Cause that's what we are trying to do. If I want to add a prediction here, I use my model R package. I use add prediction functions, add prediction function, which takes a data frame and a model, right? It adds the prediction from the model uh, to a new colon in data frame. So very similar to what we did here, we do exactly the same thing here. I create an object called grid. I pass it through this first grid, right? So this first grid, I pipe it through um, add predictions. Then, you know, I run this uh, data set called same one underscore mod. So that's the output here is a table, same 10 rows, but now two colons. So it has the first colon that we identified up here. Uh, second column is now a prediction, right? So he said, you can also use this function to add predictions to your original data set. Now, the next thing we now do to this is we plot these predictions, right? And I guess the book take, kind of takes a step back here. Like you wonder why we are doing this, all, all this extra work instead of just using geom underscore AB line. And it says the advantage of using this entire approach that we just went through. So using this, uh, data grid add predictions approach is it can work with any model in R from the simplest to the most complex, right? And I mean, you're only limited by your visualization skills. <laughs> and I think you just add a paper here, similar to how it has been doing with other um, chapters. Add the paper here. Let me just post this paper in the chat. If you kind of want to understand, if you want to understand, um, you know, visualization of data a bit more. Right. Uh, right. So next we plot the predictions. So to plot the prediction, we're running through our favorite ggplot. So ggplot, we impute the data sim one, AES for the x axis. Uh, we also create a point, uh, AES y equals to y, then create a line, AES y is equals to the prediction variable, 
data is equals to grid, a color red and a size to one, right? So that shows up as this, right? So, so now we have created, we have visualized the prediction that we identified here from this entire work we did. Now let's go into residuals, right? So he said the flip side of prediction um, is residuals, right? So prediction will tell you the pattern that the model has captured, but residuals will tell you what the model has missed, right? Um, so the residuals are just distances from the observed and predicted values that we computed earlier. So I think we talked about we talked about this in our first in our first class uh, on modeling, um, where what we explained is as soon as we get a representation like this, we're trying to get these dots to have a best fit representation, and the best way to define that best fit is which one is a lot more closer to this line. And like I said in you know, the previous class, this chapter is kind of heavily based on like linear regression thought process itself. So if you have any familiarity with linear regression, I think the chapter becomes quite easy to understand, right? So residuals um, tell you what the model has missed, right? And the residuals are just distances from the observed and predicted values that we communicated earlier, right? So, we want to add residuals to this information that we have been creating, everything we have been kicking off from here. So we want to add residuals to this. And how to do that is the same same one, the same data set. Same one, we pipe it through the add residuals function. We pipe, then we add the same one um, uh, mode data. This now creates a table that has 30 rows and three colons. So three colons, the X colon that we know, the Y colon that we know, and now a residual, right? And he said, there are different ways to understand what this rep residual tells us about the model. Again, the output of this residual is um, to tell us what the model has missed, right? Now there are different ways to understand what that means in itself. And one way is to draw a polygon, right? So a frequency polygon to help us understand the spread of this re residuals itself. So frequency, Polygon, um, uh, best represented this way. I think a better way to represent this is actually what it did down here, right? But let, let's just run through this. So let's represent a, a frequency polygon running through our favorite GG plots. Same one data set, AES becomes residual, which is now on the x-axis. Uh, we're running through the ge geom fre frequency polygon. Uh, bandwidth is 0 0.5, right? So that shows up this way, right? So he said, this helps you calibrate the quality of the model. And the question you're trying to answer here is, how far away are the predictions from the observed values uh, itself? I mean, that's, that's what we have been trying to answer with residuals. And you note that the average of residual would always be zero. I think there's a mathematical reason for that, but that's under statistics and linear regression, right? So you'd often want to recreate plots using residuals instead of the original predictor. You see that a lot in the next chapter. So as soon as we get to the model building chapter, I think we start using a lot more of the thought processes that we learn here, right? But let's just understand what this code is trying to represent. So very similar to what we did up here, uh, the ggplot uh, function, same one data set, AS, now we have an X and a Y axis, right? So the resid now moves to Y, this resid that we had there, now moves to Y axis, we have a MX axis. We run it through the geom reference line, H is equals to zero, and we had a, a geom point. Right. So he said this looks like random noise, suggesting that our model has done a good job of capturing the patterns in the data in the data set. Right. So if you can get your residuals to act quite random, at least you do have an idea that the error is not showing a very clear pattern itself. And that gives you a suggestion that you have done a good job in, in the predictive value that you have been able to come up with. Right. So I'll come back to these exercises, but let me just go into the next bit. I think around here is kind of where I stopped. So in, in relation to, after visualizing your, your model, the next part that the book, that this chapter tries to touch on is formulas and model families, right? And I think, again, this goes back to what we discussed in our first, in our first class. So when you have a data set, what you're trying to do is you're trying to represent that data set in the most simplified version. And the simplified version you can come up with is an equation itself. 
that is where formulas come in, right? So you're trying to transform the formulas that you have into a function. And you know, the, 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 the rest, the remaining part of this chapter tries to explain how you can actually transform a formula into, into function itself. So let me just read through this. So it says, you've seen formulas before using facet wrap, facet wrap and facet grid. In R, formulas are the general way of getting special behavior. I think we did this like three or four classes of, um, um, uh, prior. Rather than evaluating the values of the variables right away, they capture them so that they can be interpreted by the function, right? So the majority of modeling functions in R use a standard convention from formulas to function. And you probably see this when you are doing like linear regression or things like that. So y tilde x uh, representing the y-axis, representing the, the x-axis. So you know what should be your predictive value and what should be the variable itself or what should be the coefficient itself. And this, this standard, con this standard uh, conversion is translated into y, what you're trying to predict equals um, a, a1, right? Which is going to be the intercept, a2, which is going to be your gradient and x, right? So if you actually want to see how this transformation plays out, um, you can actually use a function that is called model matrix, right? So this model matrix function, it takes a data frame and a formula and returns a table that now defines this model equation itself. So at the end, it kind of expresses all this into a model equation uh, itself, right? So each colon in the output is associated with one coefficient in the model. And I think that's self-explanatory. And the model, the, and the function is always a, y is equals to a underscore one, um, uh, output one plus a underscore two multiplied by output two, right? So we'll, we'll see what this looks like much later in the chapter uh, itself. So let's, let's start with the simplest case, right? And I think the, 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 remaining part of this book just tries to build on this simplest case itself. So let's try to create a table. Let's see how model matrix works. So model, model matrix just helps you define that uh, model equation itself. So this equation that we've um, kind of formulated up here. So first I create an object called DF, um, call it a triple. I have three, three variables that I want to express in this. And each of these variables take two rows. So Y takes four, five, X one takes two, one, x2 takes five, six. So if I want to see what this actually plays out, I run this through um, a model matrix. I bring back my object df, then y tilde x1, right? So y tilde x1. So what does it show? Interestingly, it actually shows an intercept, right? But shows x1. So the x1 that we have represented here. And so that's why I explained the way, the way that R adds the intercept to the model is just by having a colon that is just full of ones. So you notice that all this colon are going to be full of ones, the more we actually add a lot more variable to this, right? So by default, R we always add this colon. And if you don't want it, you can explicitly drop it by using minus one. So let's go back to what we created up here. So all we just do here is I just add minus one before I close this formula, this, this function itself, right? And that's what we did here. And when you do that, it only expresses X1, right? So the model matrix grows in an unsurprising way when you add more variables to the model. So now let's, let's try to complicate this simple case itself, right? I guess it becomes a bit more interesting at first, right? So I do model matrix, very similar, the same def object, Y tilde um, X1, um, uh, now I add an extra variable called X2, right? And I, you know, expressing it shows me that intercept. Remember, if you want to pull out this intercept, we just need to end this function with minus one, right? So it takes this away, right? It shows me the intercept because I do not have the minus one, shows me my X1 and shows me my X2, right? So two, one, two, one, and five, six, and that takes us back to what is here, two, one, and five, six, right? So he said this formula notation is called the Wilkinson Rogers notation and was initially described in this particular book. Let me just post um, this, um, uh, what do you call it? This, this paper 
in the chat. I mean, most of the papers that are in this book are quite, <laughs> they're usually quite exciting to read. They are quite long though, but they're quite, quite exciting to kind of get some extra thought processes on, um, especially if, if, if one works in like a field that has some statistics in here. So he said, I mean, you can just read this original paper if you want to understand the full details of modeling algebra itself. So like expressing this and what this actually does mean itself and doing it a lot more cleanly, right? So this is another place where it now gets interesting. So the following section expands on this formula notation and now breaks it into different kinds of formats. So complicating the issue itself. Number one is if the variables that we have here, if they're actually categorical variables, right? So let's start with that. So it says generating a function from, from a formula is straightforward. When the predictor is a continuous, it's a continuous variable, so I mean, it's, it's numerical. But things become quite complicated when that variable is now categorical. I think this is where, this is where I think it gets quite interesting, right? So imagine if you have a formula, right? That's very similar to what we have up here, right? Imagine if I have now a formula of Y tilde sex. So let's say the sex is divided into male and female, right? Um, so exactly. So imagine if you have a formula Y to the sex, where sex could be either male or female. It doesn't make sense to convert that to a formula expressed like this, right? Uh, because this variable is not a number, right? It's 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 a categorical variable, and you know it doesn't have any kind of digit attached to it, so you can't multiply it because there's a multiplication sign up here, right? Instead, what R does is it converts it into Y equals to uh, my intercept plus, you know, the gradient uh, multiplied by now defining a variable itself, where this sex male is one, is equal to one if the sex representation is actually male and zero if it's otherwise, right? So let's see what that plays out uh, itself. So again, I go, I recreate my object DF. I run it through a triple. I'm creating two different variables here. One is sex, one is response, right? So I'm expressing that when you see male, give me one. When you see female, give me two, right? However, you kind of see how it's going to play out itself. So I run this same thing through the model matrix. Um, again, model matrix helps you to try to define the model equation itself. I put in the object and I try to, for it to express, give me the response if you have sex, right? So it gives me, it gives me a data set uh, and gives me an intercept, again, because I did not put minus one. It names this sex male, but you notice that it runs one, two, three, one, two, three, but doesn't put it two, puts it zero, right? Now, obviously this is a problem, right? So you said you'd, you might wonder why R doesn't, also doesn't create a sex female colon, especially because we didn't actually specify sex male or sex female, you know, but you know, you wonder why only created just one colon. And he said, the problem is that, is that will create, that will create a colon that is perfectly predictable based on the other colons. And what this means is it will define sex female as one minus sex male, which is why you are getting a zero here. Now, unfortunately, the exact details of why of this problem is of why this is a problem is beyond the scope of this book. Uh, but basically it creates a model family that is too flexible and it, would, it will have infinitely many models that are equally close to the data. I wasn't exactly sure what this meant, meant but it obviously means there's some digging in that we might need to do to understand why this would be a problem itself. So you notice that if it's trying to express your categorical variable, it gives one, it gives one to a variable, but it gives zero to the other. So if you get to a case where you actually do need these two, you know, that's something that we'll probably have to dig into to understand a bit more. So he said, I fortunately, think it refers however, to, um, sorry, uh, I think it refers to overfitting, like when a model actually fits to your data very, very well, it means that it doesn't do any prediction at all. So this is a problem. I, I'm, I'm not, um, how to say like, very knowledgeable on the statistics about that, but that's, I know that overfitting is bad. When a model yeah. actually describes your data, like absolutely 100% the model mm -hmm. and your data overlap, 
that's a yeah. thing that's that's a problem you you've messed something up and most likely some of the assumptions of the model are um violated or something so awesome. yeah it might be a cause i'm not 100 percent sure but yeah, mm -hmm. it might be sure sure thanks 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 for that mary oh no no i mean um so so he continues and says i think i i think i kind of ended up at this point so uh so Basically, however, if you focus on visualizing predictions, you don't need to worry about the exact uh, parameterization, right? So, like, you don't actually need to worry about like the representation here itself if you focus a bit more on visualizing it, right? So, let's look at some data and models to make that a bit more concrete. That visualization, visualizing predictions, a bit more concrete. So, we decide to use the same two data set. We run it through the ggplot. We have two, two variables, x or x axis, y axis. And we can fit a model to, to it and generate a bit more prediction. So essentially everything that we have been doing, you know, from scratch up here, you know, creating our own data sets and all the entire work we've been doing to predict, like add predictions and things like that. You can actually do it a bit more simply using the LM function. <laughs> right. So we 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 can fit a model to it and generate predictions. So I create mode two. I run into the LM, LM function. I have my Y variable. I'm trying to regress this against the X variable. My data is sim2, right? Everything that's represented here, right? I create a grid, a grid object, run this sim2 data. I pipe it through data grid, um, X, and also add predictions in mode two, right? So essentially everything we have been trying to do, it gives me that same kind of representation. So X represented as A, B, C, D, then it tries to predict a value, right? So effectively, a model with categorical X will predict the mean value for each category, right? And why? Because the mean minimizes the root mean squared distance. That's easy to see if we overlay the predictions on top of the original data. So let's, let's see what that looks like here. So ggplot, I run my object, I run the data set, sim2, um, looking at the x-axis. I, I try to plot geom plots, uh, y equals to y, and geom plots data equals to grid, essentially everything I created up here. Uh, data equals to grid, AES, y is equals to the predictive value, color is red, and size equals to four, right? So it says, you can make predictions about levels that you did not observe. Um, sometimes you do this by accident, so it's good to recognize this error message. So an, an example here, I think this is where I kind of stopped. An example here is uh, you run a table and you try to create a categorical information here. I pipe this through um, add predictions in mode two and it, it easily gives you an error, right? So it says the error in the model frame default terms new action and it calls this factor X as new level um, E, right? So this, this, this bit itself from this part is some things that I need to understand a bit more. Uh, but this, this is where I stopped in the book. I think I got to like 60% of the book itself. Um, the, the other part of the book now tries to break apart. So similar to how we're working through with uh, variables. So assuming that we actually now have one continuous and one categorical, what do we actually do? Uh, then it goes into a bit more detail. If we have two continuous variables, what do we actually do? Uh, then it ends the part on residuals then goes to translations. So if you now want to transform into a model formula, so you have your function, you want to go back to the formula itself. And I think it now ends up with uh, the final bit is, if you now have missing values um, in, your, in your data set itself, you know, how would that be represented when you are trying to create the model equation? So I, I guess these are the extra parts that I, that I need to cover um, uh, when I go through the chapter again, but this is kind of where I stopped um, uh, reading the book too. Great. Uh, I mean, it's a very rich chapter, uh, information-wise. So yeah, it's probably better to take like small bites of it. It's time. So yeah, you did a fantastic presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mariana. Uh, speak to you next week. Okay. Perfect. So see you. Bye. Bye.